I grew up here. My dad and my uncle owned a business in Ashland for many, many years, Hexham Brothers, so I think a lot of people here are a little bit familiar with that business, some maybe a lot more familiar. Uh, with the College of Eau Claire, and I worked at Mayo Clinic, and then I went to graduate school at Mayo Clinic. And so I was always focused on a science career in my whole life, but I kept coming back here because I had family here, and I just loved this area, like I think everybody in this room does. And uh, so, but I was gone, we've been, I've been not living here for probably 30, 30 plus years. My wife, Beth, uh, did not grow up here. She grew up in Syracuse, New York. And she's a coal worker in the building. And, but her mom and dad grew up here. And so I kind of met her for coming back to visit her relatives. And she's a relative of the Stewart and Morgan families. And uh, a lot of people I mean, just got reminded that Leroy Lee is a Stewart. Yeah. His wife is a Stewart. And uh, Mickey. And uh, so my wife has always had many of the connections to this town that I have, even though she never lived here. So she's always felt comfortable and loved the lake too. She went to college in Nazareth, college in Rochester, New York, uh, near the Syracuse, and studied art history. So when you see the rooms tonight, or you see anything that's been decorated, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> I learned by taking people through rooms and that many people ask questions who did this, and, and that's, that's been that, and with some help of Brian. So yeah, that's been kind of fun watching that. And Brian uh, was born in Rochester, lived in San Diego for a few years as a little, a little shaper, and then uh, grew up in Madison and Middleton. So he never lived in a small town like this. And so when he came back after architecture school, this was a change for him, but I think it's, it's a great thing. You can ask him. <laughs> so I want to, I just, I've got some slides that don't really have directly to do with the blue wave, but give you an idea of how my thought process is on um, places to live and fun places. And so I've lived in these uh, several cities, uh, Rochester, San Diego, Madison, and Middleton. And I've, re I've learned, I kind of knew this as things were, as the years progressed, but I've did a little bit of research, and I found that all four of those cities have won a lot of awards for being nice places to live. It's high in the livability index. And just this year, this is a website on livability, and uh, Rochester, Minnesota is number two in small to medium-sized cities that went up to about a million people, and Madison is number one. And so I thought, very interesting. And uh, Middleton has won awards for small cities. And so they've been nice places, and I've enjoyed all of them. It doesn't look, so here's a couple of pictures. You know, it's, a lot of people have been to San Diego. It's a spectacular place, spectacular climate. They do have a lot of access for people to move around in that city. This is like half a lot in the ocean. And everybody, almost everybody in every city loves bike paths, whether they're walking or whether they're riding bikes. Um, this is, a, you can see one here right along the cliffs in La Jolla. So it allows people that even living in a big city to get outside and access things. And so being outside is a key thing. And when you live in San Diego, you're going to be outside a lot because it's basically spectacular weather all the time. Madison is very similar in the summer. It's, it's a place that has put a lot of infrastructure into outdoor and leisure activities, and there's a fantastic bike path. I don't probably everybody here has been to Madison, and I don't think they've been around the lakes a lot, but in the last 10, 15 years, They've done a lot of things with old railroad grades and made it accessible. So there's, there's tons of that outdoor activity. And when you have outdoor activity capabilities, people want to live there. So they find jobs in this way. And so I always think back to what do they have? What, what, what do these towns have that are successful? And I, and I think I, on the bottom I wrote, people like to live in towns that are safe, picturesque, and have multiple outdoor leisure time activities. So, that's what I've always been thinking about for Ashland and I've watched progress over the years. And I, I, the whole Bay Area has done many things since I was younger. And I think it was all positive things for bringing more people in. But even though I've lived in those places, I still believe that none of them have a lot of the attributes that this Bay Area has. Uh, it's really unique. Um, it's right on the interface of what I call big woods and big water. 
And Northam likes to promote that information, and they do a very good job of it. But I think we've got to keep thinking about that. And uh, so I have a lot of friends that live in down south that work hard at planning their year for trips up here, whether it's the Possible Islands or various parts of rural Wisconsin. And it's because they, love, they recognize it and they love this area. So we are in a cool spot here. And it's, it's going to stay cool as long as we do the right thing. I've always wondered, I wrote that uh, second poll as a question. I don't know, do we have the longest accessible waterfront in Wisconsin? I mean, if Ashland has a pretty long waterfront that, that I think is prime for getting people on it. And that's a lot of the thought that went into this building on how to get people on this waterfront. So we have a lot of, a lot of activities, outdoor activities that everybody here knows about. And is unsurpassed for you. I did a little looking at why, you know, how many people are drawn to water. And this is kind of a study that it, it, it's believed that by 2020, about half the population will live in counties on water. And that's, this does not include inland lakes, just like Madison is. A lot of people live on water in Madison, but that's not included in that percentage. This is the coastal, coastal populations. So they love to look at water and they love to live on water. And we have one of the best pieces of water around. So now I was going to talk a little bit about Lake Superior. And again, these are all facts you know, but we probably all like to share them. Um, and to me, this lake, every time I'm here, I stare out these windows, and I think people in this building do that too and talk a lot about the lake. But it is endlessly fascinating and changing. And it's fairly big. <laughs> <laughs> it has more water than all the other lakes, and it's about 1,300 miles. So I drive to Boston a few times to visit relatives, and that's about 12, part of about 1,000, 1,100 miles. And I didn't appreciate that it's even longer to drive around this lake. So that's a big place. So here's a couple of pictures I, I put up. I, I, I am a scientist. I'm not a meteorologist, but I love weather, and I love science, and I'm constantly fascinated by things. And this farther out picture of Lake Superior, which we love, and uh, this is an April picture. You can see how we might think that we, you know, the winter's long and we're in, hooked in ice, but a lot of people aren't in ice. If you're looking closer, look at that. It's probably April, you know, April 10th, and it actually looks like it has no chance of ever getting free. <laughs> <laughs> so the pictures from the satellites are spectacular and showing what exactly is going on. And now you can access these pictures, I think, in real time. So you can always see where the ice sharks are coming in, where they're blowing out. This is a really cool picture to me, too. This is, those ribbons are called cloud streets, and that's what's given us lake effect snows. So if you look on the north side, you can see bare water. So it's a northwest wind here. It's picking up the water and it forms those clouds. And look at the south shore, you know, the ironwood up into the UP. That white band is where all that snow is being dumped. And so it's it's a real it's a real photograph of what what we when we say lake effect. And so well known in meteorology. So I did another fascinating thing to me about Lake Superior and different events. So I want to talk a minute about this spot where we are at. So everyone here knows a lot about the bottom part. And we're fortunate to have one of the Woody family here, at least one. <laughs> um, so we've had Bodine's Marina first, I think, and Bodine's on the lake, where at least those two businesses, we might have different names during that time, I don't know. Um, but this place has been famous for a long, long time. And I'm kind of including Prentice Park into this, because um, this, there's a lot of good history written in the early part of the 19th century about this area, and it was called Equidot by the Native Americans, and it was a place of gathering at the head of the bay, and mainly because of all these wells, these artesian wells. So there's not many places where you can have fresh water 12 months a year flowing. So, and so Native Americans have lived here way before anyone, any Europeans came. And we all know from uh, Sandbar or Maslowski Beach, there's a, a marker for the uh, first explorers came in 1659 and landed just west of here. And uh, they put up a marker there, which is cool. 
in, in 1887, as Frederick Prentice bought that land where all those wells were, which is the Cape Prentice Park, and it got donated in 1921. So all of us here grew up with Prentice Park existing. And I went there a lot as a kid, and uh, it was because of that donation by those three families at that time. So it's kind of a, and Nassau Beach is part of that. So that's part of that original uh, piece of land that was donated, and it's been a part of Ashland's history. I also learned uh, while I was reading this that there was a Beezer school here in town that everybody knew of. I went to school there. And Martin Beezer was one of the original kind of founders of this town with Whittlesey and Kilborn. And uh, unfortunately, a trip across the bay lost his life and floated and was found on this beach um, the following spring. And so I didn't know that until I was reading the history stuff. So it's, there's been tragedies. and. A lot of great things here. And then the Bodine's building was built in, I got 59, is it 59 or 60? 59. So, and that's been, you know, a staple of a lot of people's uh, visiting here and buying things here, and it's been a great place, a great landmark for this town. So I ran into this picture of the Historical Society, and uh, I don't know exactly what year it is, but it's pretty impressive on that side. North of people bringing a Voyager, a canoe. I don't know if they're putting it in the building or loading it, but that Oh, okay. That's a big canoe. I mean, so it, there's a lot of cool things that have happened here on this site. And so the question always comes up, uh, what type of place should go on this site? And I've had, I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and said they drove by this place for the two years it was for sale and all had to say we thought and thought and thought and we wanted we were gonna do this and we wanted to do this but it didn't work out and uh, so I had those same thoughts. I was driving back and forth by here lots of time. I just loved it. I loved I've loved this place my whole life. Um, and so we finally made the plunge and a lot because of Brian and uh, if it, it turned out to be just a great thing, and it hoped to be a great thing for Ashley. But it's, these, are the reasons, these are the reasons I came up with. If someone asked me, I, I can't give you one reason, but, and, but I think it's this location is really truly one of a kind. And there's no way to change that. There's no way to embellish that. It's truly one of a kind spot. And then we have the fact of what this lake is and what it means to all of us. Um, I love this entire area. I grew up in Ashley. I love Ashley, but I think it's really important three towns to be linked together. All three towns, Ashland, Washburn, Bayfield, have unique things. And if you live in Bayfield, you have to come to Ashland to do things. And it's, it's really important that we do things to help this whole area because it's a special area. Uh, I won't, I won't uh, deny it, but that bike trail is a big reason I've made the plunge also. Seeing people on that lakefront and close to it, was very invigorating to me. And so from the very start, I wanted to put a place here that allowed people to use that bike trail and also enjoy the, you know, basically coming to a building that, that's on that bike trail. So that bike trail was important. It might have been a hard thing to get in, but I think it was very important to this town and very useful for the long run. And so, like I said, I wanted to build a place that was a gathering place, not a place that just rented out, you know, even that would be bad, but I didn't want to just rent out space for business, or for uh, I don't know, insurance agents or something. that a lot of people could hang out. And that, so, I don't know. And then the last was, Brian told me you do it. And uh, when, you, when you're wavering on ideas and you can't decide, and then, I, I've told this many times, but Brian was at the end of architecture school, and you're at, at that point, you've been told a billion things, and you have, you have, there are lots of visions in your head. And I'm talking about the West End of town, which I truly love because I grew up on the West End. But you know, I said, well, is it, can you put a nice, nice building there? And 
said, don't worry about anything else. When you're driving down the highway, where does your head go? And it does. You look at water. You do not drive down this road and not look at the water. So if you, it's true. And, uh, so he had a total confidence to build a building that reflects history and be a gathering place. And that's, I think this is Ecuador. I do. And uh, so just, I'm going to pass this over to him and, uh, oh, a couple things. <laughs> There's a voting family I had to deal with a few times. And that's a scary thought, and I just this last year, that's this year. But luckily, it didn't come up here, it came up the beach. So the city people had to worry about that building. And it was right on the doorstep. I think if a bulldozer hadn't been brought in, that would be gone. So, and it came in fast. So all the ice blows up, and then it blows in. So there's a one to two week period of time every spring where it isn't, you're in the danger zone. And so we'll be dealing with that, and it'll be something that keeps us busy. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's that's when we made a decision about the site, and we started the construction on that day. And uh, I'm gonna let Brian go. And just just so you know, I think maybe everybody knows every corner when you're walking around this building, every corner in nook and cranny. Well, it gave me headaches, but Brian designed all of it. <laughs> and uh, so it, it's all his vision on the design, and that's pretty amazing to me. I, I, I'm in science, and I, but to think of these things isn't something I'm, I could do, and he had that vision, and he's, he's done a great job at designing this building. So hopefully people that, I know it's a change from what was here, and I, most people have been very positive, and, but I know that this is probably like this. It's so different, but hopefully when they come in, they like it. So that's that's all we can say, and, uh, but it's been a, it's been a really fun. It seems like ten years, but it's, it's a year and a month. <laughs> so on the screen now is uh, a list of all the contractors, and craftsmen that were part of the project. And if you can see the city name, it says Ashen just about every time. Um, there's a big list, uh, three pages of people here. That's a lot of people I met over the last two years. Uh, I got to know a lot of people in this town. And um, so it's truly a community project um, and also a family project. My family, every member of my family was almost involved in this. Um, and uh, I'm just really thankful I got to be sort of the leader of the whole thing. Uh, my parents bought the site in 2012. Um, and at that time, I was at uh, the University of Oregon. <laughs> and so I had a little bit of time to think about it over the phone, talking with them about what might be cool to put on the site. Uh, but I was busy with school. So when I got out of school, I joined CNS Design and moved to Ashland. And then we came here and started thinking about what could it be and the sort of trifecta of businesses that we thought would be perfect for the site would be hotel rooms to stay in, uh, coffee house, a place to get food, and then the outdoor store. And luckily Solstice is right in town and they're a perfect business model for us. Um, and they um, were really excited about it coming and being part and uh, being tenants in the building. Uh, so then in the fall of 2013, I got started uh, thinking about the design and what that should be. I often get asked, uh, what is the main design idea? And the most clear form of the whole thing is that it's a nautical theme. Um, and it's supposed to represent images of, of the surrounding area. Um, so I spent a lot of time looking at pictures um, of board ships on the lake. And another thing that was interesting was when you look at pictures of Ashland, you notice that a lot of things are this maroonish, dark red color. Uh, board ships, the ore dock was that color, brownstone buildings, even the sea caves. So right away that color had been in my head from even the early, early sketches. So working through it, um, 
at work. It felt like the coolest thing in the world that I got to be doing this for a job right after school. It was, I couldn't even explain it. Um, from the roadside, if you look at it, it's supposed to resemble more of a ship. And then when you see it from the lake side, it has those piers, and if you walked out there, it feels a little bit more like the ore dock. So it has two different representations sort of, to interpret, um, depending on what side you're looking at it from. And these would have been renderings I did in the fall of 13, going into the winter. Um, and then through the winter was a lot of the design of the inside, doing construction drawings, and also getting permits. Uh, I think it was like, there was a lot, it was six months of meetings with everybody you could think of, and uh, got nine permits, I think. And uh, we had all those by the spring of 2014, and that allowed us to start construction. And uh, before demolition of Bodine's, we uh, donated the windows to High Bridge Hills on the Frisbee Golf Course. So they came and took out all the windows, so those got reused. And then the building was torn down, and um, we just had a low frost. Well, the foundation had actually, the sand underneath was still in great shape 55 years later, so that's pretty impressive. Um, for, so the foundation here is really solid. Um, and the formwork, uh, you can already start to see the shape of the building. Um, early on, we'll the footings down on the ground. And this is Arnie Mackey Construction, and they were the one contractor who was really along the whole way. Um, everyone else had their time, but Arnie Mackey was here for a full year and a month. And that's the fog of early summer. Uh, it was almost maybe even June, and it felt like it was 40 degrees. It was, uh, <laughs> slowly starting to climb over the ground. This is almost like an architecture education now. Maybe everyone can design a building after seeing this slideshow. <laughs> there we have in-floor heat. Um, and then that's the rebar, and then the concrete gets poured over the top of that. And then you can start to erect walls on top of the concrete foundation. And so they see the stud walls in the middle. So the building's a combination of Standard frame construction for the interior walls, and then these panels that are called SIP panels, uh, structural insulated panels stands for, and that makes up the whole outside of the building. So there's super insulation, you could call it, on this building. I just want to say something, right? So when, at that stage right there, I can't tell you when people came up, it must have been a little delays at that point. I think it's going to be kind of a small building. <laughs> So that wood, that framing was up for maybe for a few weeks, and a lot of people came up to me and they asked, we think they're, you can't believe the stories that come back, that they ran out of money, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, And uh, then also you see the steel columns in there, so there's a variety of materials that go beyond just what a conventional house would use. This is inside the solstice. Um, and then you can see the panels on the ground, and they're all numbered. Um, so it is kind of interesting. They I have a computer model, and technology is pretty incredible these days. You can take your computer model and then I basically, the company is called Intercept, they take it and they break down your model into these panels. And so I had to design everything really perfectly ahead of time, but once you get it, then it all assembles like a puzzle. And that's for the outside walls only. So once you had the shell, that was all empty and hollow inside of here. Uh, we also had some very large beams that are still exposed. And that beam right there is this one along here that you can see, and it extends out the cantilevers, and that forms the bodines or cantilever. There we are putting it in. And then it ran through. And when we did the, the event at Mike Miller's house last year, about a year ago, we were at this exact point, and then we came and walked under it. 
just like that. Um, these are Arnie Mackey guys. Scott Zinnaker and Paul, I can't remember his Paul's last name. Lindsay. Lindsay. <laughs> Now we're up to the third floor. You start to see the circle windows emerging. Floor trusses for the third level. And now we're on top, so this is the hotel level. A view from the Bodine's room. And with the SIPs, uh, it enables you to have a cool lofted ceiling because you don't have a truss. You get the high ceiling effect and they can span all the way to the ridge beam. And this might be a, a lot of people's favorite spot in the building. That's bedroom number three in the hotel, so that's the view you wake up to.
they allowed this to happen and they had to do some steps to do it. And so the city deserves, the city council and the planning department deserve, from my, you know, from my point of view, deserve uh, a lot of credit for helping us get this done. And so if this is, becomes a staple or a location a lot of people come to in the future, they have a big hand in allowing this to happen. 